I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sandra Barnes. Uh, Dr. Barnes is a sociologist and she also is a minister, ordained minister. So she works at the intersection of divinity and sociology. She is currently chair of the sociology department at Brown University. Dr. Barnes has uh, a, a fabulous chapter in the book. So when you purchase the book, you'll get a chance to read everything in full. But I am happy now to turn it over to Dr. Barnes to share with you some of the highlights of that chapter, that God is indeed in control. Dr. Barnes. Thank you, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to first thank um, Drs. Gwendolyn Wright and Sandy Darity for inviting me today to share some of the information from my book chapter. Uh, as, as she mentioned, um, God is in control. And so today I'm going to be just highlighting some of that information and then we'll have time for Q&A as well. I'd like to start this particular presentation with a quote from Hardiman and her colleagues called Stolen Breaths that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so I'll read this because it provides the context for this particular study. Black communities bear the physical burdens of centuries of injustice, toxic exposures, racism, and white supremacist violence. Racism is productive. Any solution to racial health inequities must be rooted in the material conditions in which those inequities thrive. Therefore, we must insist that for the health of the black community and in turn, the health of the nation, we address the social, economic, political, legal, educational, and healthcare systems that maintain structural racism. Because as the COVID-19 pandemic so expeditiously illustrated, all policy is health policy. I'd like to start with this particular quote because it provides some insights in terms of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the ways in which the broader society um, is beginning to understand some of the dynamics of the intersectionality of some of these facets that I've, I have here in um, highlighted. It's really telling that this particular piece, and it's worth really reading, was included in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a pretty conservative outlet. Also, this particular study included references to George Floyd, included references to some of the challenges, race-based challenges and unrest that we see in society. And so it, it provides the context for my presentation. First, I want to talk about, again, the broader ecology for my book chapter. I focused on two questions. How is COVID-19 affecting religion for black and white Christians? And do religious concerns vary by race? I focus here on Christianity because as we know in terms of the literature, Christianity is the largest faith tradition in the United States. And so I really wanted to focus on that particular dynamic, focusing on blacks and whites, um, largely because of the constraints in terms of the study. But again, I've done quite a bit of research on this topic and I'll be happy to, to chat about it during Q&A. And so I wanted to focus on these two particular questions from the perspective of the Marshall family. Let me tell you a little bit about the Marshall family. The Marshall family um, consists of or is led by a matriarch. She is a widow, Constance. And this particular study focuses on Constance, her five children, four daughters and one son, and their seven children, two who are minors. And so my, my qualitative sample is a sample of 11 that I'm using to contextualize a broader examination of academic studies and mainstream information. In terms of the Marshall family, they vary in terms of age from ages to 20, from 20 to 78. The, the mean age is 41.5, varied in terms of education, 
And I also selected this family because they live in what I'm calling hot spots. And I have a schematic to illustrate that next. So they live in, a pla in places where a disproportionate percentage of African Americans have um, contracted um, COVID-19. And so this particular study focuses on, again, the Marshalls as a jumping off point to examine this particular phenomena in a broader way. This is also a mixed methodological, methodological study focusing on qualitative information. I'm going to be presenting representative quotes from three themes, as well as quantitative information to, again, ground the work. In terms of the qualitative data, they are based on in-depth interviews taken from May through June of 2020. Well, actually, this turned into a longitudinal study, and I'll be happy to talk about that. But right now, the qualitative interviews were based on a pretty rel a relatively short period of time because of the nature of the pandemic and how quickly changes were taking place in the country relative to COVID-19. The interviews ranged from 30 minutes to 90 minutes, and many of the Marshalls enabled me to interview them several times. So I wanted to really think about this particular, st this particular experience from the perspective of scholars like Bronfenbrenner and Billingsley, who assess micro, meso, and macro level dynamics. If we think about structural forces, if we think about values, if we think about debt networks, if we think about systems, how do they affect, trickle down, and affect the attitudes and the behavior of everyday people? And so this is the context for this particular study. Now, in this particular schematic, I wanted to briefly talk about those hot spots. Again, places where a disproportionate percentage of African Americans, I shouldn't say a disproportionate percentage of both cases and deaths associated with COVID took place. So I was interested in, well, let's think about Indiana, Georgia, New York, and Illinois. These are places where the marshals lived. And so I'd like us to focus on those last four columns where I've, identif I've identified race, black and white, the percentage of that particular demographic in a given state, as well as the percentage of reported cases and the percentage of reported deaths associated with COVID-19. And so let's take a look at a couple of examples. If we look across Indiana, you'll notice that this, these reported state statistics show that 9% of the state consists of people who are black, while if we think about the percentage of reported cases, 18% of the reported cases of COVID were black people. And if we think about the percentage of reported deaths, 16% were African American. So if you think about those statistics, we have twice the, num twice the number or twice the number of African Americans in Indiana have contracted COVID and pretty much twice the percentage um, have died. Similar patterns if we think about Georgia, and I have them highlighted here, if we look at the statistics in Illinois as well. So again, in terms of what these numbers tell us is, based on the representation of the individuals in their state, a relatively higher percentage of them have contracted COVID-19 and have passed based on the disease. So I'm interested in what do these statistics, what do they tell us broadly about race and religion for the Marshalls in particular and for African American and black Christians in general? So those were the, some of the empirical values to undergird the study. Now I want to talk about some of those qualitative findings. And three themes emerged from my interviews with the Marshall family. And so I want to just, again, share a few of their representative quotes. Now this first theme I've entitled, To Meet or Not to Meet. And as you all know, corporate worship is critical among Christians and the black church is crucial in the black community. And so that gathering experience is very important. This particular theme identifies the tensions associated with the inability to engage Christian and church spaces that the marshals were used to. And so I'd like to read this particular quote. It's from Constance. Again, she's the matriarch of the family. I quote, 
I can't go to church to meet other people and go to Bible study. And I help with the kids. I miss most being able to come together, just seeing people and talking to them. Now we have to take communion at home. We call them little things, but they are still important. You have to look at Zoom for preaching, the Bible class, and activities with the kids all happen on Zoom. You can't even go to the building. And so for Constance, this was very detrimental to her emotionally and psychologically and spiritually because the church was such a place of sanctuary and solace for her. We also know this particular, the positive dynamics of church involvement for black Christians like Constance is juxtaposed with the findings that tell us that church spaces were often, especially initially during the pandemic, they were called super spreaders where literally people are coming together, many times they didn't have masks on, and you would just have swaths of people contracting COVID-19. And so although corporate worship was critical, unfortunately, the, the fact that persons were congregating, literally, increased the likelihood that they were going to be exposed to the virus. It's another representative quote from this same theme. This is from Keith. Keith is the son, Constance's son. I, my mind races now. Church used to help calm me down. I'm worried about a lot. My mom, who's recovering from a heart attack, COVID-19, and now George Floyd. He represents all those black people who have been killed going back to Emmett Till. I've been stopped by cops too many times to remember. I pray for the protesters every day. Sometimes I think, if Rona doesn't get us, the cops will. So Keith is very, very, he's very transparent about the traumas that he has experienced in the past and how in his mind and in his experiences today, they've been exacerbated by COVID-19. And according to, to Keith, going to church was what calmed him down. Church provided a sanctuary for him and helped what I'm calling help mediate the challenges that he has experienced. And this is really important if we think about what are some of those social, what are those social institutions, those social organizations that have been able to mediate things like the pandemic and to what degree have they been or are they consistent and effective over time? Major takeaway for theme number one is initially, Initially, there was the tendency for black and white Christians to downplay the virus. People continued to go to church. They continued to engage in spiritual spaces, Bible study, the way that they had in the past. However, over time, studies show that there were some differences based on race in terms of motivations around protesters, as well as the reasons for people refusing to, refusing to, to um, social distance refusing to take, um, to participate in PPE mandates. For the marshals, marginalization, so historic oppression and current concerns about George Floyd, current concerns about political unrest, current concerns about racism, meant that the marshals and black Christians like them actually had more at stake for not going to church because the church provided them again with a refuge to kind of combat some of that negativity that they were experiencing. When we looked more deeply at the findings, we found that, or I found that, black and white Pentecostals and evangelicals were more likely to push back and to reject those mandates around social distancing as compared to their non-evangelical their non and non-Pentecostal peers. Other studies show that, again, even when you had black and white Christians protesting and refusing to, um, to social distance, the motivations tended to, to differ. For black Christians, there tended to be a focus on faith, meaning persons were saying, I'm going to go to church because I believe that God's going to protect me. God's not going to allow me to get COVID. While with white con um, Christians, especially white conservative Christians, their motivation was very different. They believe they, had, they have a right to go to church. So their reasons were very politically motivated. 
They have a First Amendment right, and they, they demand that they should go to church. Even though the motivations differed, the end result, unfortunately, was pretty much the same. Higher percentage of people contracting COVID because they continued to go to church. They continued to engage in corporate worship. I've entitled my second theme, It's My Right, Civil Religion. And this, is, this augments the information I was just alluding to. This particular theme focused on the way in which Christianity has been appropriated because of COVID-19. And it's been appropriated in the form of civil religion. And most of you are familiar with work by Bella, work by Williams and Demereth where civil religion is defined as the tendency to supplant Christian beliefs, Christian iconography, Christian items like prayer and the Bible with the American flag, with patriotism, with First Amendment rights. So at the heart of civil religion is the tendency to deify nationalism. When you're lifting up nationalism the way you would the Bible, you're lifting up nationalism the way you would Christian tenets. And so we've seen an increase in, Christ, in civil religion among white Christians as COVID-19 increased as well. And so these representative quotes illustrate that dynamic. So these are experiences, again, of the Marshall family and how they can be connected to civil religion. So we have the first um, quote by Donald. He's a 22-year-old college student getting a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. He's also a frontline worker, so he works at a big box store that I've called Save Mart. You can kind of guess what it is, but Save Mart. And so he's, he's working in a predominantly white space, and he's telling me the challenges associated with this space because he's working so to pay his way through school. So he's exposed to increased risk because he has to work to help pay the bills, but he's being exposed to civil religion. So here, there, are a lot, there were lots of arguments because everyone was trying to fend for themselves. Nowadays, they seem like they're pretty much ignoring the virus. Even though we have a six foot rule, people ignore it and in the checkout lines, people are right up on each other's backs. They reverted back to shopping like they did before the virus. Now I'm seeing a lot of customers with no mask or gloves. Save Mart will allow you in without a mask. I've just been asking God to protect me and my family from COVID, but I was already doing that before COVID. I ask God to protect us no matter what the danger. This particular representative quote was important because again, he's describing the challenges associated with the, his work life around the pandemic. And if you all remember initially, people were just again, going about their no, no, normal lives, if you will. And he was exposed to persons who, again, were not wearing masks, even though he was doing that. And he also described, I, I, don't have, I didn't have space to put it in the, the um, chapter, but he described how when he got home at, at the outset of the pandemic, that he would take off his clothes, his mother would, would basically have to wash them separately, he would have to just went through this ritual to try to protect himself and his mother because he knew at work he might be exposed to the pandemic. You notice also, even at age 22, he's connecting his religiosity with an attempt to push back and to protect, protect himself from COVID. He's praying to God to protect him, but then he also says, oh, I was always doing that. This particular representative quote is, is also important because the Pew statistics tell us that when we look at millennials, when we look at, at younger persons, we have the, the, the church is less relevant or considered less relevant today than it was historically. And so we have an increase in black and white um, young people who are either unchurched or what's called de-churched, where when they were younger, their parents kind of forced them to go to church. And when they became adults, they stopped going. And so this particular quote is important because in the Marshall family, I didn't see that pattern. Persons, even young people, were still involved in Christianity and still attempting to live out their faith. This next quote even hits home even more deeply in terms of this issue of civil religion. Because remember, civil religion is where people are replacing Christianity with nationalism. And this quote is from Lyle. Lyle is um, the cousin 
It is the cousin of the young man that I just shared a, the quote about. 22 year old getting his degree in electrical engineering. Another st a student who has to work to pay his way through college. I quote, I miss my girlfriend a lot, but the hardest thing is getting the strength to go to work. The people that come into the store don't really know any rules, don't follow any rules. Some have their face mask cover, some have their face mask covering their mouths, but not their noses. Most of the time, I'm there all day with people who don't follow the CDC rules. They keep saying, it's my right as a US citizen to not wear a mask. I don't want to put my family at risk. I don't want to put my girlfriend at risk because she has diabetes. So she's at higher risk. Lyle's interview, I interviewed him several times, was quite troubling. If you imagine a 22 year old who described, he literally said, I have to get the strength to go to work. Really having a difficult time going to work. He works in a, um, uh, a store that sells um, telephones. And he said that people would, and this is in a predominantly white space again, um, he would say people would come in and they would have their masks, some people would have their masks on, following the PPP, um, PEPE guidelines. Other people would have their masks over their, their, their mouth but not their nose. Other people, he said, would come in with like the mask under their chin. Um, and some people would just kind of make fun of the, the rules in terms of, of the mask mandates. And this was very stressful for him. During the, the early onset, of, of COVID, he did not see his, he only interacted with his girlfriend via FaceTime because, because he went to work, he did not want to expose her because she has really um, chronic um, diabetes and um, he did not want to do anything that would jeopardize her health. And so we have here these front examples of two young frontline workers who are dealing with traumas as they're navigating their workspace but who actually have to go to work because they need the money. And so these work-related traumas were very, very important, as well as thinking about the way in which Christianity was helping them to navigate those challenges. Last reminder, this whole notion of it's my right as a US citizen to not wear a mask, that is quintessential, um, quintessential, um, what do, how do I want to phrase it, civil religion rhetoric. Quintessential civil religion rhetoric. Some of the major takeaways of theme two. The research suggests that white people, white Christians, white Christians were more apt to espouse civil religion than their black counterparts. And this particular kind of thought process is very indicative of privilege and entitlement where people believe I am entitled to do, to think this way, to behave this way, even though it may cause me detriment, and even though it may cause other people detriment. As I mentioned before, in terms of the representative quotes, this kind of inconsistency in terms of social distancing and following the, um, the COVID mandates put members of the Marshall family at increased risk for contracting the virus. However, one of the things that emerged was a response, a spiritual religious response that seemed to strengthen the Marshall's resolve, where persons believe that, well, I'm going, God is still gonna look out for us. We're going to pray. We're going to follow the dictates of, of man because we know that that is reflective of being a good Christian. Also, one of the, the troubling pieces, another troubling piece about this particular theme is, so when you think about civil religion and the way in which it's manifesting here, it actually is contradictory to Christianity. Christianity is about um, relationship building, community building. Civil religion, or its appropriation here, is a very us versus them mentality. We want to do this, we don't really care how it affects you very contradictory to Christianity. And this is one of the unfortunate manifestations of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you think historically, if you think about work by when Bella was writing, civil religion in and of itself does not have to manifest in this way. My contention is there is a, we, we've gotten to a point in the pandemic where it's, appro it's being appropriated and it's manifesting in a negative way. My third theme is entitled, This Too Will Pass. And this particular 
theme highlights the use of Christian beliefs, the use of Christian practices to navigate the pandemic. And the quotes here suggest, it's very, very interesting, suggest very, very specific ways in which the Marshall family is attempting to make sense of and attempt to live out their Christian edicts no matter um, what the, what's going on relative to the pandemic. So again, this is the matriarch constants. And you're gonna see some themes here in terms of some practices that were very common in the Marshall family that also have manifested in, or evident in existing research about these same dynamics. When I go to bed, I pray. I still thank the Lord that in the middle of the pandemic, you still have a lot to be thankful for. It could be worse. It's just trying times. People have lost their jobs and people are standing in line for food that have never done that before. It's just hard on people. It confines you. It feels like you aren't free. But the Bible says that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but you have to have a sound mind and use common sense to deal with corona. And I never did think something like this would happen in my lifetime. But my pastor preached that plagues that have killed lots of people, that he preached about plagues that have killed lots of people that I had never heard of. This particular quote is really interesting because Constance is actually paraphrasing 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And so she's suggesting that if you use a sound mind and common sense, then you can navigate and you may not get corona. So very, very clear connection in her mind between the Bible and a, a biblical prax, prax, um, principle and how she should behave. And you're going to find, I found in this particular theme, the tendency to refer back to the Bible. Well, the Bible said this, my pastor said that in an attempt to make sense of the pandemic and in an attempt to, to glean strategies to protect them from the pandemic. You notice here, she's referencing about plagues in the Bible, referencing Old Testament challenges, but she's suggesting that the same way that God helped people through those kinds of structural negatives, that God will help her and people like her through the pandemic. This particular theme suggests that for the marshals and for persons like them, the pandemic, people associate increased faith with the pandemic. And there's a really good article by Gesowich which shows that blacks are more apt to say that their faith actually increased as a result of the pandemic as compared to their white Christian counterparts. Lola is Constance's daughter and she has another assessment of the, the pandemic and what it means to, to her Christian faith. It has improved my religious life because we have a prayer ministry every Sunday at 8 a.m. I listen to multiple churches and to Tony Evans. He's a popular black televangelist. It has increased my spiritual life because I'm praying more and I read my Bible more. I've always done it, but I do it more. There's going to be hundreds and 10,000 that fall by my side. I know this sounds bad, but he has me. So Lola is describing her increased religious practices. She's also paraphrasing Leviticus 26 and 8 that describes God's assurance against enemies, against plagues. Um, and in her mind, COVID is yet another plague. And as I mentioned, this is a common practice of referencing scripture in a way to allay fears and in a way to foster confidence that no matter what is going on around them relative to COVID-19, somehow they have a special dispensation because they are Christians and because they are following Christian edicts. Claudia is one of the younger members of the Marshall family and she's describing a situation in terms of connecting that which is social and that which is economic because two of the marshals did actually lose their job as a result of COVID. And we know the findings that a disproportionate percentage of black and brown people, especially service workers, were, uh, and, and people who are working in the service industry were displaced as a result of the pandemic. 
and this happened to Claudia, yet she has a very different take on how she is navigating that reality. I quote, my supervisor was trying to reassure me that I'd have a job, but I knew they didn't want to let us go. I realized that I needed this time to work on my family and to work on me. In the long run, it has helped me. I realized that God is very powerful and he's with us no matter what. It forced me to become stronger in my faith, pray more and depend on him. And I hadn't realized that I had stopped doing that for a while. So according to Claudia, she's actually using this time outside of, because she's lost her job, to really bolster her Christianity. She's realized that she had kind of become what I called again, a de-churched. And now she's gone back to her Christian um, faith and is really reflecting upon the, what it means to be a young Christian. This particular quote is also supported by, again, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, it parallels Pew, Pew statistics that show that there are racial differences in terms of how Christianity manifests among young people, um, in particular millennials. There is a greater tendency for um, African American as compared to white Christians, young white Christians and young white African American Christians to pray to go to church, to read their Bible, and to say that faith is an important part of their lives. When I consider some of the major takeaways in this particular theme, by and large for the Marshalls, they tended to have an increased prayer life, increased tendency to pray, increased faith in God, and increased thankfulness for what they have and that what they're experiencing despite the pandemic. Increase in virtual worship and engaging in self-reflection. And this is something that I found in my research, even beyond this particular chapter, the, that among millennials who are Christian, among young people who are Christians, they were already engaging in vir virtual worship before the pandemic. Many of them, if they, they didn't want to go to, to li literally be um, in a church space, they could look on, at television and look online and engage in worship. I found that in terms of young black Christians, um, as well, no matter whether they were straight or if they were gay. So I have some really exciting work around that in terms of the fact that young people were already engaged in vir virtual worship. This particular theme also illustrated the tendency to reference scripture, the tendency to reference the Bible as an example or as evidence, I should say, of the fact that the marshals felt protected and they had instructions in terms of how to avoid the pandemic. And then as I mentioned before, the millennials, this, their experiences were supported by peer, um, Pew findings, but also were very different from what, we've ex what we expect to see relative to um, young Christians in general. If I think about, if I step back and think about some of the major findings, it does suggest that for the Marshalls in particular and for black Christians in general and also some white pockets of white Christians, that religion and family can serve as a mediator, as a mediator for some of the challenges, some of the emotional and psychological challenges associated with the pandemic. This was definitely evident for the marshals and also apparent in some of the academic and mainstream assessments of Christianity and the pandemic. One of the dynamics that are one of the kind of the conundrums associated with this work is if you think about the church as a mediating, a place of mediation, a place of sanctuary, a place of solitude, and you think about what could happen when you congregate large groups of people together, it suggests that for some black Christians, a closed church can be just as damaging as an open church. I'll say that again, a closed church can be just as damaging as an open church. And I can talk about that a bit more during Q&A. My findings also suggest that there are some, some, clear, some clear challenges relative to race, relative to space, and by space I'm referring to these hotspots where the marshals lived, 
as well as place relative to church. When we think about quality of life and when we think about life chances for people like the Marshalls. As I mentioned before, my findings are very clear that there are some racial differences in terms of belief and behavior around COVID-19. As an aside, the, this particular study really encourages, it encourages me and I hope it encourages some of you to engage in what I'm calling creative centering. Many times when, especially as young, as young academics, we we're told to always have a comparative sample or comparison sample. So let's say if you're studying black people or you're studying Hispanic people, you, all, you always were encouraged to have a sample of white people that you can compare them to. And there are some benefits associated with that. That's one of the pieces that I've done here. But also at the heart of this particular study is centering the marshals, centering a small sample, one family, and then using them to expand in terms of a comparison, a broader comparison of other racial demographics. So this centering is gonna be important and I encourage persons to think about what are some of the benefits associated with intra-group studies. This is, the Marshalls, that's an intra-racial study. And again, I was able, I was fortunate to, to be able to go back and interview these same, this same family two additional times to see how the pandemic was affecting them. This was initially at the outset, but I wanted to find out what's happening six months later, what's happening nine months later. And some of the findings were really, um, of course, troubling, but it's still important to be able to document those dynamics, especially for me, the, our academic work should also have applied dimensions. So after we document the academic stuff, if you will, then what are we gonna do with it? What kinds of strategies and best practices can we create to address some of those intersecting challenges that Hardiman wrote about in their quote at the outset of my presentation. The same way that, the, that Hardiman suggests, we have to think about all of these social, economic, political, and health dynamics. This does remind us of the importance of thinking about remedies to challenges like COVID-19, to think about them from a holistic perspective. So yes, we have to think about vaccines, we have to think about boosters, but we also have to think about spirituality, we have to think about religion. What are those economic and non-economic factors that are crucial to enhancing the quality of life and the life chances of persons? And for this particular study, it suggests that Christianity and or some form of spirituality is for some of the marshals, just as important as a booster, just as important as a, a, a vaccination in terms of helping them to navigate the pandemic. Thank you. I'll stop there and open the floor for any questions that you might have. Any questions? Yes, please. So uh, I'm in the business of trying to vaccinate people every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, in communities that are medically underserved. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often I hear these community members telling me that the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. is gonna take care of me mm -hmm. and that that vaccine is not necessary. I just wanna say one thing about this virus. Uh, you get this virus and you're among those at-risk populations and you sit with this virus too long there's a point of no return. It's gonna be an ICU admission, mechanical ventilation. The longer you're on mechanical ventilation, about a 30% chance of survival in the hospital. And, and, and so what I'm saying is that there's some realities to COVID-19 that are gonna be very difficult to look away from. We have sat down with pastors that said, don't come in my church with a mask on. And we, saw members of the choir pass away because they came to church anyway. Um, during this pandemic, when people were not at church and they were having virtual mass, uh, there were still places where people came to church in person. And those individuals that came to church in person were older. Uh, and they represent the most, and again, when you're older, and we're talking about much older, 
having underlying comorbidities that put them at the greatest risk for the most severe consequences of COVID-19 disease. And the pastor didn't have no problem with that. And so what I'm saying is that the pastor has a place in this that is very critical. And the pastor can take this uh, to heart and make a difference because we all know people of faith that the pastor has great influence in the church on the congregation. And so I, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yes, um, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, def one of the, a couple of things that I'd like to mention is for the marshals, none of the marshals rejected the um, mask mandate. None of them rejected social distancing. In effect, they were actually, um, they did a great job of, I think, mediating their spiritual beliefs and the reality of what, what are some practical, logical things that you need to do to protect yourself. You make a couple of things, some of, uh, a couple of books that I've written on the black church in general and the black mega church, focusing on the role of the pastor. And what you're sharing is, um, has to be couched based on the profile of churches and the profile of the pastors that lead them. My findings show in general, when you have pastors that are, are more formally educated, when you have pastors that, again, have attended seminary, not Bible college, when you have pastors who are part of what I'm calling more progressive churches, and when you have churches where education as well as some notion of some understanding about black consciousness. Those are some of the common features where you tend to have less of what you described and more of churches embedding Christianity in practical ways to respond to situations like COVID. So you are correct, but it's important to think about the type of pastor that, that you're talking about because the type of pastor is going to lead churches in one way as compared to another. Another piece to, to, that to be mindful of is at the outset, and I mentioned this at the beginning of my presentation, at the outset of the pandemic, you, you tended to hear that kind of rhetoric, as well as, and, and I've cited some of these examples in my book chapter, with that kind of rhetoric, there were examples where literally not only the, the vast majority of the church was wiped out as a result of COVID, but in some cases the pastor as well died. And so you tended to have that initially. But over time, over time you saw less of that once the reality of the number of cases and the number of deaths increased. Not to say it's not still out there because there are, and again, this goes back to one of my other findings. When you think about conservative churches, when you think about those, those conservative evangelical churches, you're still getting that same kind of unfortunate rhetoric but it's definitely not to, the, not to the degree that it was initially because people have just, it, it's very difficult to kind of respond or to continue to maintain that rhetoric in the face of people dying around you. But that's the conundrum that, people, that some people are experiencing. What is the, what's the appropriate place for my faith and some kind of practical, logical manifestation of what it means to be human? Some people are trying to navigate that. Some folks are saying, faith first, God's gonna protect me. We don't have data to show that outside of, um, the evidence does not support that stance. I'll leave it at that, okay? Yeah. And so, but your point is really well taken. And this goes to, takes us to another point in terms of um, the fact that a disproportionate percentage of pastors tend to be male. But in the black tradition, a disproportionate percentage of the congregants tend to be female. So you have a males um, shaping the dictates of what is manifesting in, in the lives of females. One of the, an, another chapter that I wrote for another piece about the marshals moves, again, six months later when I talk to the, largely to the women in the Marshall family about how they're navigating the pandemic. And one of the themes that emerged was, and this thing was called Rona and relationships. Because I talked to them, what does it look like six months out, eight months out, when you're dating? Or when you have a, 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 a most of them either were engaged or they were dating someone. And one of the findings there was the tendency for them to directly or indirectly actually put themselves at risk 
because they were dating persons who were frontline people. And then when, and think about how this looks in, in terms of on the ground every day. They, they wanted to see their partners. They wanted to see their boyfriends, if you will. Yet, when their partners came to their homes, they often did not wear a mask. So you, you have, that's where it gets really challenging. And these were the same women, again, that I've just quoted, who were, who were um, connected to scripture and making connections, uh, same Christian women. And this is what makes the, the writing about the every, how people are navigating COVID makes it so challenging because there are a variety of threads that inform their daily lives. There is no nice this or that, um, yes or no. It's very nuanced. And for me, my, my challenge is, given that, given that nuanced reality, how do we still create some strategies and some best practices to increase the likelihood that folks are going to be safe? But thank you. Very good point. Yes, continue. Yes. As I said, I said it didn't change for everybody. And, it, and, and let me even go further. For some people, it is not going to change. That's a reality. For some people, it is not going to change. That is also a reality that as, as, as though, for those who are scholar activists, that we're, we have to navigate. And one of the things that I suggest in response to, to that thought is when I'm studying the pandemic, as well as I do a, quite a bit of studying around HIV, is given the fact that we have a continuum of, of attitudes and behavior. We have people on this end who, again, they, they embrace social distancing, they embrace whatever's necessary to, make, to protect themselves. Then you got folks on this other end, like you're saying, who are like, I'm not changing anything. What, I'm, what I try to write about is, um, at the end of all of my work is, how do we address that reality in a practical way? And my contention is, meet people where they are. Some churches are going to have a litany of, of, of practical responses to COVID, practical responses to HIV. Other churches on the other end, they are, that's not happening. And so that's, that's a, a um, sobering reality that we have to be mindful of. That sometimes we're expecting this, again, all churches, to want, I mean, to, to preach about um, boosters and vaccinations. The reality is we have a continuum. Um, Lincoln and Mamiya wrote about this in the 1990s in terms of a continuum in terms of the way in which black Christianity manifests in the black community. Because that's a reality, there are groups of people, there are swaths that can do more and that are doing more. But there are churches that it, we may have to go in and continue to talk to them. Maybe encourage, if they give us a, 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 a platform, have a conversation. If they don't give us a platform, go to those churches that, that will. Yes, okay, I'm sorry, because I know our time is. Yes. One question here, one question here, and we'll wrap up. Okay, all right, yes please. First of all, I just want to thank you for a very, very rich talk. And I think it has universal applicability. Mm -hmm. I'm a physician, and epidemiology, you're always dealing with human beings. Mm -hmm. And you have to deal with them, even if they do everything that you don't want them to mm -hmm. do. You know, and I think that's a part. I just wanted to add, and I do have a specific thing that I want. Mm -hmm. uh, you, are you familiar with the fact that in South Korea, there was a church that had 4,200 pe people who got infected? And it was the first grouping in Korea, you know, because your work is applicable. Right. And that would be very interesting to see how, you know, how the Korean government, I mean, South Korea is mostly a Christian country. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I think that would be something that I would love to hear you comment on because I was puzzled by that. And there were all sorts of problems with the pastor mm -hmm. in, you know, and, and, and how that country dealt with it because they, that was the first outbreak. They solved it and Korea had a very low, mm -hmm. uh, you know, prevalence of the disease, and they, they had a tremendous success, and they did most of their testing on the church, mm -hmm. because after that, you know, people complied, you know, became a national symbol. But the, the, the other thing is, your work would be incredibly useful in New York City. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm, I'm Christian, a uh, Catholic, but I worked in the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic community, and the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic community didn't follow any guidelines, and it was like a civil war between Mayor de Blasio mm -hmm. and them. And you are absolutely correct that the pastors are so important. And uh, there are so few people who understand this community. And 
you know, my family had three, every, everybody wondered why I would work there. Mm -hmm. Because because this community is seen as so totally non-compliant. But my family has had three generations of contact going back to, you know, the beginning of the ninth beginning of the 20th century. And I, I think your work would be extremely important in helping New York City solve that. There's a professor at Brown, Omer Bartow, I don't know if you know who he is, but he is Jewish. He was actually on the committee where, when, when Brown dealt, dealt with slavery, mm -hmm. he's Israeli and he's very concerned, and I know him and I've communicated with him and I think your work, I, I think you could, you know, this Hasidic community is a super spreading community. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get the CDC involved in them in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to share that, you know, that insight. Oh, def and you know, thank you for absolutely. sharing that. And I, I think your work is just absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Uh, quick response um, to the question, and then I'll, I'll take the last question. In terms of, of the, the robustness, one of the things that I, I do know is very important is that our research be robust, meaning beyond the marshals, beyond the US context, can some of these, these takeaways be broadly applicable? And a couple of things to be mindful of that I, that I would wonder about is in terms of Korea, the connection between the Christianity or, or the faith tradition and the government, also what it looks like relative to a, a relatively closed space as compared to something, a place like the United States. That's another dynamic to be mindful of. Also, the, the piece around culture. The United States is a very individualistic society as compared to many other societies. And so we see individualism influencing how Christianity manifests. It goes back to civil religion, goes back to, you mentioned, whether the folks in Korea are compliant. If, if, if the studies show that in spaces that are more communal in nature or where there is a higher tendency towards kind of communal, a communal culture, there is a much higher tendency for people to comply to things that benefit the community. In the United States, it's the exact opposite. We tend to be, and it doesn't mean there aren't communal spaces. We know churches are communal spaces. But our overall culture is one of individualism. And we actually applaud ourselves for being individual. And there are some key benefits associated with individualism. But there are some challenges, and one of those challenges is it does undermine the tendency to think about other people. It's, it's me, my, me and my. And we see that trickling through in terms of some of these manifestations of, of how people are responding to COVID. But yes, I'd be happy to chat with you about it afterward. One last question, please. Thank you so much for the presentation as well. I guess the question I had was in relation to the principle of the golden rule. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one that we believe that drives most religions. And so in the case of civil religion, mm -hmm. my concern was to what extent is that principle being applied within that religion? Because for the most part, I mean, most charismatic Christians or the evidence that you found in your study, pretty much what was working was the golden rule. Mm -hmm. I was pretty much thinking how my actions would impact the other. I mean, as an economist, we use that, you know, even in addressing some of the social problems we have. And so my, get, my question is, to what extent is, was that looked at in your research? Mm -hmm. Again, how does that influence the civil religion in, in particular? Excellent question. This, at the heart of it is the, what, what are the challenges of appropriating Christianity in a culture that is highly Christian, but in a culture that is also being fueled by things like fear, fueled by things like tension, fueled by, because if, if we remember at the, now we feel better because we know more now, but at the outset of COVID, if people coughed around you, all, your head would just jerk. People were afraid. They were literally petrified of COVID. Disproportionate percentage of older people were dying. And so as a minister, I can't tell you the number of virtual um, funerals that either I officiated over or was a part of. So people were terrified. What does that mean and how does that play out in terms of Christianity and COVID, if you will? And so for the golden rule, what we see is with civil religion, for c civil religion is steeped in the social construction of reality where my reality is the way that I'm moving through the world and my reality is the way in which I expect you to understand how to move through the world. And so it is, it, it's a, even though it's intention, it's intention with the golden rule. That is the, if that's the way people are thinking, that is how they have constructed their reality, then for them, that is real. Even if we don't agree with it, 
even if that's not our reality, that is their reality. And for their reality, that us versus them is the appropriate way to understand the Bible. It's an appropriate way to live out the Bible. And those are, each, each of us, I, if, I probably could, could get different assessments of even the golden rule in this space. That's all linked with our social construction of reality. The civil, civil religion becomes so problematic because it's so staunch and so embedded that persons have difficulty moving beyond their belief because instead of thinking about truths and beliefs, they think my truth is the truth. My belief is the belief. And what we see happening is the persons who embrace civil religion, pastors, were more likely to sue their states so they could go to church. They're more apt to, these are the folks that, that, that are showing up with guns. And for them, they're saying, this is what God is telling us to do. It, 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 it's, in, it's in conflict with what most of us would understand civil, um, um, the golden rule to be, but they're, they're what we call, they're appropriating it, meaning they're taking it, they're, they're manipulating it to satisfy their needs. Yes. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for your questions. And have a great day.